So, I recently took a tour of the DMZ, otherwise known as the Demilitarized Zone, the area of land between North Korea and South Korea. And while I was there, I managed to pick up this. This is North Korean alcohol. The person I was talking to said it was North Korean whiskey. I'm not sure it actually qualifies as a whiskey. We'll see. Its official name is Pakchisan Ganoderma Liquor. It is 40% proof. I'm not only going to try it on its own, I'm going to make several wittily named cocktails with it. What fun for you. I should say, I have a friend who has an interest in North Korean alcohol. He's lived here several years and uh, he, he examined it for me. Several interesting things. It has an export label. So it's from before the embargo. It wasn't smuggled out. This, this was exported. So it's, um, it's at least seven years old. It's made from acorns and something that he couldn't translate. He, we looked it up on the internet. The internet couldn't translate it. He guessed it was a kind of mushroom. We don't really know. We'll find out. We'll see. We'll see what notes it has. Uh, first of all, we'll, we'll nose it. Is that what they say in enology? Nose it. It smells like nail polish remover. Goody. Is, is there anything else? Is there anything else to do? No, just ethanol. So because I am super bachelor, I only have one mug. This is it. First, just packed sun Ganoderma liquor on its own. Let's go. Come bay. It does taste like cheap whiskey. I'm, I'm almost tempted to say I can kind of get like a, a hint of the acorn, like there's a certain nuttiness in the aftertaste, but that, that could just be psychosomatic. If my friend hadn't told me acorns, I probably wouldn't taste that. It's not any better on the second try. If I had any cuts in my mouth, this would be painful. To be fair, it's not worse than some other whiskeys I've had. Imagine what whiskey from North Korea would taste like. You got it. It's just not going any better. On to the mixology. I had originally planned to do uh, a couple of cocktails. I'd made up some really cool pun names. I was gonna do a Manhattan, but with this, and I was gonna call it a Pyongyang. I could not find any of the ingredients for any of the cocktails that I wanted to make. We're gonna make new cocktails. I have mango juice, apple aid, peach soda, sparkling passion fruit juice, grape aid. So we're gonna see what we can make with the flavors that I have. Apparently there's a version of a Moscow mule that you can make with peach. So instead of a Moscow mule, I'm going to make a Pyongyang pony. So you take the carbonated peach soda and you pour it into the one disgusting plastic yellow mug that you own. Then you add the Paxan Ganoderma liqueur. Liquor, not liqueur. It's not fancy enough to be a liqueur, it's just a liquor. Acorns and peaches. That classic combination. Chin chin. That's not bad, actually. Yeah, I think it helps that I added a lot of the peach. You can barely taste the Pakistan. It just tastes like peach soda. It's probably not that alcoholic, to be honest. It's only 40%. <laughs> Whatever. Next, I found out that there's a version of a Cosmopolitan that you can make with grape juice. So instead of a Cosmopolitan, we're going to make a Kimsmopolitan. Again, we're trying to drown out the liquor. That's, that's the last of the grape aid. Add the Paxan Ganoderma liquor. That just tastes, tastes like grape. I will give this to the 
the packed sand doesn't necessarily blend well so much as it just kind of disappears when it's put with other things. And isn't that what you want? To just get drunk without knowing it? I might actually add some more of this just to get myself buzzed quicker. Okay, now I can taste it. Mmm, there it is. Yeah, that was okay. Just grape juice and whiskey. Like adults drink. The packed sand does not grow on you. It never tastes nicer. <laughs> Those are the two named cocktails that I managed to find variations of that match the juices I was able to buy. So from here on out, we're just kind of making it up. I'm going to say that passion fruit is the closest to cranberry taste-wise. So this is what we're going to use for our Pyongyang. Pour, pour, pour. Mix, mix, mix. Slingshot. It's been a while since I've drunk passion fruit, and I don't know if it's that I don't remember how passion fruit tastes, or that this does not mix well with passion fruit. I I, I think it might be the latter. This there's there's something very dark about this cocktail. Something almost smoky. The other ones were much more um, effervescent feeling, whereas right? this. Oh no, this, this is the kind of thing that you write poetry to. No, no, good poetry. We're going to make up our own bespoke cocktail now, which I'm going to call the Third Tunnel, because after he drinks one, that's where he'll let you put it. We're going to put in some peach. We're going to put in some mango. We're going to put in some apple. And the pièce de résistance, Pactosan Ganoderma liquor. Yeah, yeah. No, this works. This is good. This is light. It's what I want. By the way, if you don't understand the name Third Tunnel, I will explain in a second. I'm starting to feel that, but Pyongyang dizziness. The Third Tunnel has been evacuated. My final idea for a cocktail was to mix packed sand Ganoderma liquor with the most South Korean drink I could think of. Soju. I don't really want to drink this, if I'm honest, so I'm only going to mix them in trace amounts. And I'm going to call this cocktail Unification. Pack sand and soju. Unification. Here we go. Goodness, that's foul. That concludes the wine tasting portion of the video. Now, I want to recount my trip to the DMZ now that I am appropriately hammered so that I can give the subject the delicacy that it deserves. DMZ, the demilitarized zone. It's a bit of a misnomer because it is quite a militarized zone. You, you go through army checkpoints, you see people in army uniforms with weaponry, you see a lot of, well, I mean, parked tanks, but you still see tanks. So to me, this zone doesn't feel that demilitarized. Go figure. So the DMZ has been closed for a year because of swine flu and then corona. It just reopened, but they're not allowing as many people in as they used to. Apparently, there used to be thousands of people a day. Now they are allowing 150 people every day. So I was lucky to get in. The JSA, the Joint Security Area, is still closed and I was not able to go. So sadly, I was not actually able to step into North Korea itself. I booked with a tour. I was lucky because our tour was bisected. There were two transports to the actual DMZ. And we had the tour guide in the morning. And then on the way back, we had no tour. The other bus had no tour guide in the morning. And then they got all the information after they had seen the DMZ. And I preferred having the information going in. It was very handy to have the context because I will be quite frank, I did not know a lot about um, the separation of North and South Korea. I knew roughly when it happened and I kind of understood the ideological split to a, to a degree, but I did not understand a lot of the specifics. Our tour guide did a wonderful job of condensing a lot of history into an hour and a half drive up to the border. Knowing Korea's Chumachos history, 
tumultuous. Knowing Korea's tumultuous history really did lend a lot of gravitas to what I saw at the DMZ. We arrived at the DMZ quite early. In fact, it wasn't open yet, but she was like, you can look around, but obviously it's <laughs> it's a border and it's an army zone. There is not a lot of it you can look around, really, unless you have the ticket to go inside. Oddly, there is a theme park at the DMZ that wasn't open. Just the fact that there was, like, one of those Viking boats very prominently next to all this memorabilia about the Korean War. To me, it very much, uh, it provided a very fitting visual representation of the ideological divide between communism and capitalism. We got tickets. We first went to the third tunnel. The North Koreans built several tunnels to make sneak attacks into South Korea. They claim that there are many tunnels that have yet to be discovered. The South Korean government says that's hokum. This is the third of four that have been discovered. The third tunnel is quite far underground. So you arrive and they're like, you're going to walk down this walkway of Murmama meters down and then you'll find the tunnel and you hear the number of how many meters down it is I don't remember how many meters down it was and you think that's a lot of meters and then you actually walk it and you realize that is a lot of meters down the tunnels themselves are pretty gross they're quite wet they're very cold and there was a frog there was a live frog in the tunnel. I asked when I got back up how the frog got in there and they said they didn't know. I said, is he a North Korean defector? And they said, sir, no one can get through the tunnel. I'm still working on the assumption that the frog was a North Korean defector, especially because when I mentioned it to my guide, she said, yes, he probably does come from North Korea because there is more wildlife in North Korea. So I met a North Korean frog. It's a very oppressive atmosphere, which is appropriate given what the tunnel was made for and given the fact that it's a tunnel. I, there's not many ways you could spruce it up. It was the closest I got to North Korea, so you can go to the third outermost wall, which is 170 meters from the North Korean border. 170 meters away from fascism is a very good way to describe life in 2020. My guy told the story of the discovery of the third tunnel, which apparently involved a defector who had been instrumental in the construction of the tunnel, revealing that there was a tunnel that they had not found, although he had forgotten where it was. Next, we went to the Dora Observatory, from which you can see into North Korea. Everyone not just me, everyone became very voyeuristic, very nakedly voyeuristic, as soon as you were given the opportunity to actually see life ongoing, life in situ in, you know, a fascistic regime and not just, you know, watching Fox News. There are a bunch of binoculars that, at which you can stand. They all pretty much have the same scope of vision. And as soon as anyone spotted a person, they were immediately like, there's a person at this location and everyone turned to try and see. And I will admit there was something fascinating about observing people who are actively living under such a dedicatedly fascistic regime that, you know, warps the truth, that really does play with reality and people's lives. And obviously it's not like we observe a witch hunt or the secret police bursting in on someone. It was just people working in a field. One thing that I thought was interesting was it seemed like a lot of people were wearing the same clothes. I imagine that that is some kind of uniform. It was bright red. However, my guide did say that there is a propaganda village that's very near to the border. There are people who are summoned to live in the village and they having better quality of life, a very performative way of life. We just happened to spot people working on an organic farm and riding bicycles. There was a sign on the mountain, so you could see several mountains. 
mountains, there was a sign on a mountain written all in red that apparently said something like, come to the future with us. It was like a propaganda sign written on the mountain in Korea, specifically to try and tempt defectors. There are very nearby a South Korean flag and a North Korean flag, and the North Korean flag flies a lot higher than the South Korean flag. After the Dora Observatory, we went to the local DMZ market, which is where I bought these. These are soybeans grown in the DMZ, covered in orange chocolate. You might be able to tell, I already tried some because I'm a weak willed individual, but I will try some more on camera. I'm drunk enough that I don't remember what they taste like. I love orange chocolate and I don't like soybeans. So this will be an interesting flavor combination. Chocolate and soy does not go together. Can you see the, the, the orange chocolate soybeans? Do they look tempting? Do you want some? Final thoughts. I found the DMZ tour very interesting. I think the story is, it's, is in itself inherently fascinating. It really kind of highlights, it really kind of highlights the political tensions involved, the ideological conflict, the real human impact of what is going on there. There are minor details that really kind of bring things alive. For example, in the third tunnel, you can see the dynamite holes. And uh, when the third tunnel was first discovered, the North Koreans said, oh, well, you built the tunnel. And then South Koreans said, no, because the angle of the dynamite is such that it, it couldn't be, it couldn't have been built by us. And you can see that as soon as you see the dynamite holes, you're like, yeah, that does not make sense. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't build it that way. A big question that will be on everyone's mind is how dangerous is a trip to the DMZ? I went at a uh, quite politically volatile time, I would say. Um, recently, North Korea uh, shot a South Korean soldier. I did not feel in danger. When we were at the third tunnel, we were told, if you hear this siren, run. We did not hear the siren, so everything was fine. Obviously, you cannot predict when there will be crises, but I did not feel that I was personally in very much danger at the DMZ. I would recommend going if you are at all curious. I am quite drunk and I want to go to bed. Good night.